Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to worship. I'd invite you to stand as we begin our service with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, you are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. O oh God of power and might, your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. Give us the wisdom to know what is right and the strength to serve the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Abiding Presence, a place of grace where all are welcome. Our mission is to seek God and serve others. Welcome to those who are worshiping online, and for everyone here in person, thank you for making your reservations online ahead of time as it helps us make sure we can keep everyone safe while we gather here. A couple of announcements for us tonight. On Saturday, December 5th at 10 o'clock a.m., we will have our Advent Adventure in the outdoor chapel just across the parking lot here. It will feature carols and crafts. And in fact, the crafts will be based on some Christmas carols. How cool is that? So please join us. It'll be a great time of fellowship, um, and it's available both in person and online. We just need you to register ahead of time. Uh, you can find that online or in the link on the Friday email. We also have several music events coming up. Our Christmas Handbells concert will be on Sunday, December 6th at 4 o'clock p.m., Right here, it'll feature carols for handbells, chimes, and keyboards. Um, we ask that you make a reservation ahead of time at APLC.org. Also, our Noel's at Noon concert series will be held on Thursdays this December. Uh, the first concert in the series will feature mezzo-soprano Jacqueline Matava on Thursday, December 3rd at noon. And speaking of December, we want you to be aware that this Christmas Eve, 
we will be offering five different options for you and your family to celebrate with us. Our five services will be on December 24th at 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and 11 o'clock. So we hope you'll join us for that special holiday celebration and keep an eye out for more information coming soon. And lastly, this week we are concluding our three-week stewardship series called Be the Gift. And to share with us more about this is the chair of our stewardship committee, Lenny Kirkman. For just a minute, let's think about the future. That day, who knows when, but definitely someday, when this sanctuary is filled with people singing to the glory of God and giving thanks for the gift of our salvation through Jesus Christ. Imagine the choir behind me or the precious cherubs right there, smiling and waving at their families before they sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Focus on how wonderful it will be to shake someone's hand or give a hug when we pass the peace. These images in our minds are possible because we have faith that one day that will come. So what do we do in the meantime? As we forge ahead through this unsettling time of sadness, uncertainty, and everything else we're feeling, how can we actively keep the faith and not lose hope? Simply put, we can be the gift that God made us to be. God is absolutely at work here. We talked about the truly amazing things the people of Abiding Presence have managed to do to keep us connected, to support our ministries, and to even grow this body of Christ and spread the gospel virtually to more people than ever before. None of this would be possible without the time, support, love, and generous gifts of this congregation. Thank you so much. Can we sustain this? Can we do more? These are great questions. The answers are up to you and me. You may know this Abraham Lincoln quote, the best way to predict the future is to help create it. Instead of worrying about the uncertainty ahead, can we set our sights on creating the best future possible for the people and the things God has entrusted to our care? There are great needs here at Abiding Presence in our community and across the world. I can't predict the future, but I imagine what it can be. God is calling me and calling you to be the gift to this place and to each other, to come together to create the future of Abiding Presence. All of us, regardless of our situations, can make a positive difference and keep us actively moving forward toward that future we envisioned a minute ago, maybe even toward a better future that we can even not even imagine today. Not sure where to start. Here are four things you can do. Invite, help connect someone to God's love and grace, share our worship link and encourage them to attend in person or online. Sign up. Invest time in your faith journey and connect with others by joining a Bible study or helping build a new small group ministry. Pray. Ask God to guide you and all of us to embrace a spirit of gratitude and generosity so that Abiding Present can reach more people than ever before. Volunteer. Make a commitment to serve others in a new way. More than ever, it will take all of us doing what we can with our time and for those who can with our financial resources to sustain and grow our mission and our ministries. There is much to do. In response to God's unconditional love and gift of redemption and with great hope in the future, please join me and be the gift. And now let us turn our hearts and minds to the hearing of God's word.
A reading from Ezekiel, chapter 34, beginning at verse 11. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by their watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pastures. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A reading from Ephesians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Well, good evening, everyone. And can we just like give one more round of applause for our chapel chimers? Aren't they incredible? 
That was so awesome. That was so great. Well, tonight in our Bible lesson, we're going to be reading about some sheep and some goats. And so I wanted to know, can you tell the difference between sheep and goats? So I brought a picture with me of sheep and goats, and I want to see if you know the difference. So I'm going to raise one up and let's see if you can get it right. Which one is this? Goat. How about this one? Are you sure? Are you sure you're sure? All right, well, let's see how you did. Oh, you got them right. Good job. Good job. You know how you can tell the difference? The goats, they have, they have like, like straight horns like that, right? And when sheep, sometimes sheep can have horns too, but they're more curly. But the sheep have like more wool. And, and, and the goats, they, they're for, their wool is kind of like flatter and smaller, right? So, um, well, in our Bible lesson today, we're going to hear about Jesus. And he's going to return and he sits on this throne and he judges all the nations that are gathered before him. And he separates them, and the Bible says, like, sheep from goats. And on the right, he puts the sheep, and the sheep say, you know, or he says that they're blessed because, because when he was hungry, they gave him food, and when he was thirsty, they gave him water to drink, and when he was in need, of, when he was sick, they visited him. And then on the right, they say, well, when did we see you hungry, Jesus? And he says, when you did it to the least of these my, members of my family, you did it to me too. And then to the ones on the left, he says, and you're accursed because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. And when I was thirsty, you didn't give me water. And they say, Jesus, when did we see you hungry and thirsty? And he says, well, when you didn't do it to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. And the point of our story isn't that doing good things gets you to heaven or anything like that. The point is that when we belong to Jesus, just like, like sheep belong to a shepherd, then we do the things that people who do who belong to Jesus, and that's showing Jesus' love to our neighbors. So let's all pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for creating sheep and goats, and we ask that you would help us show love to our neighbors, just like God shows his love to us through you. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of our Lord. I'd invite you to be seated. Well, well uh, excuse me, let me welcome you to the end. We made it. And this is indeed a weekend of endings. 
we are marking the end of our stewardship series, Be the Gift. Over the past three weeks, we have been hearing from members of our stewardship committee, like Lenny, about how we can be the gift to each other and to the world. We started the stewardship series with the parable of the bridesmaids and being prepared for the coming of God's kingdom. And then last week, Pastor Steve talked to us about the parable of the talents and how we are called not to live in fear of what God has entrusted to us, but to do something as stewards of God's creation. Now, not only is this week the end of our stewardship series, it's the end of the season of Pentecost, or ordinary time, which marks the end of a church year. Next weekend, we will welcome in the beginning of a brand new church year with the season of Advent. And in an act of symbolic alignment that we may have come to appreciate from the all-wise designers of our lectionary, that three-year cycle of recommended Bible passages for every day, weekend, and special occasion in the life of a church, this week we heard a gospel lesson that is also about the end, the final judgment of all the nations before Jesus. During this judgment scene, we hear Jesus tell those who he places on his right, whom he calls, blessed by my Father, who will inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, that when he was hungry, they gave him food. When he was thirsty, they gave him drink. When he was a stranger, they welcomed him. When he was sick, they took care of him. When he was in prison, they visited him. These blessed ones are confused. They ask Jesus, when was it that all these things happened? Jesus replies that to the extent they did it to one of the least of these members of his family, they did it to him. Then we hear Jesus address the ones who are accursed whom he tells to depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, because when he was hungry, they gave him no food. When he was thirsty, they gave him nothing to drink. When he was naked, they did not clothe him. When he was sick and in prison, they did not visit him. These accursed ones are also confused, not understanding when all these things happened. Jesus replies that to the extent that they did not do this to one of the least of these, they did not do it to him. Now, for some of us, this passage can be unsettling. When we reflected on this story in high school buzz earlier this week, Mike observed that immediately after reading this, a person wonders, am I a sheep or a goat? It's just sort of the natural reaction to reading like, the option like that. Um, in fact, several folks who I talked with throughout the week um, seemed to agree that this all feels awfully simplified, right? Uh, one person at our Monday coffee noted that it feels more honest to talk about how it feels like we're on almost like the sheep goat meter that can fluctuate from day to day, right? No one's always a sheep or always a goat. Um, and one of the high schoolers at High School Buzz noted that people can be complicated, right? And sometimes we do bad things based on good intentions. So what do we do with that? How does that work? And of course, there are no simple answers here with this passage, but to understand what's happening here, to kind of get behind what's going on, it helps to keep in mind that Matthew, and in fact a good deal of the New Testament, was written in this literary genre called apocalyptic, which in Greek translates to unveiling or uncovering. In the slightly more um, spicy apocalyptic parts of the Bible, like Ezekiel, Daniel, and Revelation, we get imagery like dragons and monsters and horsemen, bizarre angels with multiple faces and too many eyes. In Matthew's world, which is a little bit more toned down, yet still definitely apocalyptic, we hear of Jesus as this sort of shepherd king sitting on the throne and separating the sheep from the goats. Apocalyptic literature is complicated, but one of its main purposes was to use these dramatic, symbolic stories to not just offer hope for the future, in this case, the return of Jesus, but also to reveal, to uncover the truth about how the world really is and the truth about who God is. So, even though this passage is depicting an apocalyptic judgment event, this issuing of a judgment, a ruling, a decision, and I mean, seriously, it wouldn't take much adapting to fit this dialogue into like a courtroom scene from Matlock. It seems to me that what this story is saying and doing is much more along the lines of describing the judgment of Jesus as in like a character trait. 
the judgment of Jesus in the sense of the discernment of Jesus or the good sense of Jesus. When we read this passage, we get a sense of Jesus' priorities, his criteria for what ultimately leads to life abundant and what leads to death. And so really, the final week of a stewardship series is the perfect time to remember that in Jesus' good judgment, in the end of all things, when all the nations are gathered together before the throne of the shepherd king, Jesus' priority is this. How are we caring for the least of these who are members of God's family? This story uncovers the reality that Jesus' priorities are not the priorities of the world. The world prioritizes the greatest, the powerful, the wealthy and healthy, those who are free to do as they please without ever thinking twice about the consequences. In fact, in the verses directly following this passage, all the greatest ones, the chief priests and the elders, almost immediately begin conspiring to kill Jesus. The good judgment of Jesus is threatening to the powers of the world. You see, Jesus has different priorities. Jesus seems to be concerned with the needs of the hungry or thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, those in prison, and lest we think that this question is only asked of us as individuals of how we care for these, remember that before the throne of the shepherd king is gathered all of the nations. We began this stewardship series by asking if we're prepared and awake to enter the kingdom of God whenever and however Jesus shows up. And then last week, Pastor Steve asked if we're willing to do something with what God has entrusted us, instead of being paralyzed by fear. And this week, I would like to invite all of us to ask the question, are we aligned with the priorities of Jesus? Is our stewardship of what we have been given by God aligned with the interests of the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, those in prison? Are we willing to do something for the least of these? to be the gift to those for whom the world has no regard, those who we don't notice, the unseen ones on the margins, behind bars, even if we don't recognize Jesus in them? And I know for a fact that for myself, this isn't always the case. Much of the time, my sheep goat o meter leans over towards the goat side and I fail to to demonstrate Christ's care for the least of these. And that's why, in the face of this enormous task, it makes a difference to me to remember that Jesus is the King. Jesus, who we have been getting to know all through the Gospel of Matthew to this point. Jesus, who heals lepers and honors the faith of centurions. Jesus, who told his disciples not to judge, who desires compassion and not a sacrifice who didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus, who loved hanging out with tax collectors, who goes on from here to be crucified by all the greatest people, only to rise again victorious over death itself. Jesus, the shepherd king, who cares for the least of these members of God's family, who looks on us with mercy and love, empowering us through his example to be the gift to the whole world. Amen.
Let us together confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Sovereign of all, train our ears to hear your cry in the needs of those around us. Bless all social ministries of the church through which we seek to serve others as we ourselves have been served. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You cause rain to fall on the just and unjust alike. Direct our use of creation to provide for the needs of all people in ways that are sustainable for the earth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Bring peace to every place where conflict rages. Heal the sinful divisions we erect between us and release us from systems of oppression and prejudice. Restore our capacity to see your image in those whose dignity we have stripped away. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Visit American homes on Thanksgiving Day. When we are separated from loved ones, embrace us with your care. Keep gathering safe. Even in our reduced celebrations, give us voices to offer thanks to you for your perpetual blessings. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Pour out the gifts of your spirit on children and youth throughout the church. Sustain those who work in children's ministry youth ministry, and campus ministry as they nurture the gifts of young people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We beg you to end the Earth's pandemic. Bring healing to the millions who are suffering from the coronavirus. Any who are sick, dying, despairing, isolated, unemployed, and all exhausted medical workers. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Thank you for saints now departed who fed the hungry, clothed the naked, and tended to the sick. Inspire us by their example that we may see your presence in those in need around us, especially Michael Sirwaki and those we now name aloud are in our hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share a sign of peace with one another. God, peace with you. And be peace. As we conclude our stewardship series this week, we have been remembering that the good judgment of Christ the King is to show care to the least of these members of God's family. When you support abiding presence, it empowers us to align with the priorities of Jesus in caring for all the members of God's family, particularly the most vulnerable among us. Each of you is a gift, and we are so grateful for how this community embodies the gift of God's love to our neighbors. Thank you for your continued generosity.
Let us pray. God of all goodness, generations have turned to you, gathered around your table, and shared your abundant blessings. Number us among them that as we gather these gifts from your abundance and give thanks for your rich blessings, we may feast upon your very self and care for all that you have made. Amen. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen us and keep us in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this simple meal, you have set a banquet. Sustain us on the journey. Strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children. And give us glad and generous hearts as we meet you on the way.
beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.